Sorry I couldn't be with you there in person for this MGBGAC event, but here I am on tape, so will you join with me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, we pray. Amen. Things were a little tough for the people of Israel there in Egypt, and it had started off so well for them. They had been kind of welcomed into Egypt because they were the brothers and sisters of Joseph. After all, he was the one who had saved the Egyptian people from starving, and of course had saved his own brothers and sisters and family as well. When they first got to Egypt, they were heroes. They were treated to a party. It was great. But 400 years had passed, and now there was a pharaoh who didn't remember Joseph. And now things weren't so great for the people. In fact, this pharaoh had this big building project that he wanted to do, and he looked around and he saw all of these Hebrew people, all of these Israelites, and he thought, hey, they can go to work for me. And so he had them busy as slaves, working all day long, every day, and in fact had just decided to punish them by taking away the straw so that they couldn't use that to make bricks. They had to make just as many bricks without straw and only mud. Things were not going well for them at all. They remembered, though, when Joseph was alive, that he had talked about the God whom he worshipped. And they remembered this God themselves, the God of Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Rebecca and Jacob and Rachel and Leah. They decided that they should call out to this God for help, that they should say, help us, save us, make it the way it used to be, take away all the bad things and make it good again. And if you could send us somebody just like Joseph, you know, somebody who looks like Donny Osmond, who looks great in a loincloth, and can sing and dance, and make the Pharaoh sound like Elvis, that would be a plus, too. Well, you know, God heard the pleas of people to save them from all of this hardship. But God said, I don't really have the Donny Osmond model, but here's what I can send you. I can send you a murderer who was raised in a lap of luxury but fled when times got tough, somebody who's been taking care of the sheep for several decades, and oh, by the way, you might have a little trouble understanding him because sometimes when he speaks, it's not all that clear. How will that do? Well, the people must have thought if that's what we got, that's what we'll take, and so Moses became the savior of the people, the one who would lead them out of these hardships because God was leading him, the one who would eventually lead them through the Red Sea. But getting to that point of salvation wasn't as easy as they expected. They probably thought, you know, a snap of the fingers for Moses and out they go. But in between, there were all these horrible things. There were gnats, and there were locusts, and there were flies, and there were boils, and there was hail, and all that yucky stuff. They didn't realize they were going to have to go through all of that to be saved. They lived through it, though, and Moses led them through the Red Sea, they got away from all of the bad things and hoped that things would be just like they had been before. In fact, they were so elated that they sang and they danced the oldest song in the Old Testament. But then they began to look around, and they realized that here they were, out in the middle of the desert, and nothing was what it used to be. Nothing was like what they had expected when they were saved. In fact, they had no resources, they had no food or water, and they were at each other's throats. This was not what they expected when they asked to be saved. Now when I think about this little story of Moses leading the people through the Red Sea away from the Egyptians and into their salvation toward the Promised Land, it reminds me just a little bit of the PCUSA. Think about it. We used to be the ones who were honored in every town in which we found ourselves. We were the captains of industry. We were the civic leaders. We were the ones who helped write the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, for heaven's sake. We were the ones to whom people used to turn when they wanted an opinion about something, when they wanted to turn to someone who was really smart and knew what to do. But it's not so much like that anymore. In many towns, we are not turned to because we are the brightest and the best. We are not the civic leaders anymore. After all, really, who in the big, wide world wants to know what the Presbyterian Church thinks about some international incident anymore? We are kind of like those people in Egypt where the Pharaoh had forgotten who Joseph was. 
People have forgotten that John Witherspoon, the only minister to sign the Declaration of Independence, was a Presbyterian. They've forgotten that Abraham Lincoln, one of the best presidents of our country, worshipped every week at First Presbyterian Church in Springfield. You can still see his pew there. You're not allowed to sit on it, but his pew is there. They've forgotten that Eugene Carson Blake stood at the forefront of the civil rights movement. They have forgotten who we are. And so, like the people of Israel and Egypt, we have cried out for salvation. God, save us. Make it like it used to be. Take away all the bad things and take us back to where we were, where we knew who we were. And we came up with something that we thought might be our salvation. It was called reunion. We put two churches together. We thought this would be it. This would solve our problems. Everything would be wonder wonderful after this. In fact, we were so elated that we took to the streets of Atlanta and we marched behind bagpipe players and we sang old songs too. But it hasn't turned out to be exactly what we expected either. Because here we find ourselves with fewer and fewer resources and we find ourselves at each other's throats as well. So is there good news for us here us in the PCUSA? Well, perhaps. Perhaps it will depend upon whether we can decide that there really is authority to which we submit when we take our ordination vows and that we're not just making this up as we go along. Perhaps we will have to answer the question about whether we can trust leaders who have been chosen by God in the only way we know to discern God's choosing, that is, we have elected them. Perhaps we will have to answer a question about whether we are willing to follow not knowing where God is leading us. Now is there ultimate good news here? You betcha. This is the good news of God. There is always good news where God is involved. We know that God's intention is still for people to know God and to know that God loves us and intends the best for us. We know all of that through the life and death and resurrection and promised return of Jesus Christ. But perhaps the question for you over these next few days is to think about whether as a church we can set aside our pettiness, our turf wars, our exhaustion, our small vision long enough to find the way in which God is leading us into the promised land.